So it's going to be trillions and trillions, $700 trillion of assets. Well, why does that matter? Well, the trust industry takes about six to 8% of global GDP to make it work. Lawyers fees, accountants fees, auditing fees, bank fees, settlement fees, all kinds of fees. And the bankers love those fees because that's their revenues. So why do they hate Bitcoin? Why do they hate Ethereum? Why do they hate XRP? Because it displaces the need for trust because we have truth. And that truth in a decentralized world running on computers that manage themselves through block rewards, we don't need the banking system anymore. What's up, guys? Kevin Cage here with another crypto update. We're going to run through some recent news today. we got a bunch to go over. That clip I played in the beginning of this video was on Good Morning Crypto's YouTube channel with Mark Yusko with a really good analogy that we essentially don't need the banking system anymore. We don't need this centralized infrastructure and DLT basically eliminates the need for trust. So he discusses a lot here, trillions of dollars. And then why does that matter? Because related to trust, that basically accounts for six to eight percent of global GDP. And naming all the types of fees here, so lawyer fees, accountant fees, all these intermediaries. And for those that may not know, Mark Yusko is a big name in the space and an investor. We can see CEO and CIO over at Morgan Creek. And heading over to IMF.org, we can see they have a data mapper. So this is something I like to look at to look at global GDP. So we can see 109,000 measured in billions. So the global GDP is approximately $109 trillion. So when he said 6 to 8% of global GDP, we'll just say 7% right in the middle, 7% of $109 trillion is about $7.6 trillion. So I thought that was interesting, and that also falls in line with what the CEO of Casper Lab said about 5 to 9% of global GDP basically accounting for or just verifying that things are actually true. So we have real GDP growth at 3.2%. Remember that real GDP factors out inflation, but it doesn't necessarily factor out debasement of currency. So I have some bullet points on my other monitor so I can express this better, but basically inflation is the increase in the price of goods and services over time. So if inflation is 2% a year, what cost $100 today might cost $102 next year. So basically just showing the rise in the prices of goods, which also reduces purchasing power. But there's another consideration, which is the debasement of currency because of all the monetary printing that we've had over the past few years. And the weird thing, or maybe it's a convenient thing for the U.S. government, is that debasement of currency isn't really quantified. We have CPI for consumers. We have PPI for producers and inflation. But this doesn't really account for debasement of currency because of the monetary printing where the actual value of the dollar loses its power. And I've seen estimates of debasement of currency. It's definitely interesting listening to the presentation shared by Ralph Powell. But the thing is, I just don't really know how to confirm that, whether it is, in fact, actually, you know, 6 to 8%. So if it's 6 to 8% or even higher, plus actual inflation or the CPI of 3%, that hurdle rate is the sum of those two. So to sum this rant up, we know that government just shares CPI or inflation and says, oh, we're only at 3% or 4%. But the other consideration is debasement of currency, and that can be even higher than inflation. So you would take the sum of those two, and you would actually see that prices are rising and the value of the dollar is getting weaker. So overall, this is one heck of an environment. We don't know how this ends up, but this is one of the main reasons that people see value in digital assets. Because the protocols of different crypto networks might have a fixed supply like Bitcoin if it is inflationary or variably inflationary, we know why. When it comes to the Federal Reserve or other central banks, we might have an idea of what's going on, but only what they're telling us. All right, next up, so we have Ripple Payments Direct. I'm going to link this in the top of the YouTube video description for anybody interested. I see a lot of conversation and sentiment swings all over Twitter talking about this, not needing XRP, but I think it's just the wording. For me, this doesn't look any different than ODL, even though ODL is now under Ripple Payments. Essentially, still using XRP just looks like a new and improved ODL version that's more compliant. And again, I'm biased because I hold XRP. I've researched it for a long time, so I'm happy to be corrected to better understand this. But here are my basic thoughts today. So we can see right here, Ripple Payments Direct. So with Ripple set up as a payments provider, you no longer need to buy, sell, or own XRP. So this is the sentence that freaks everybody out, but as you scroll past the data flow, the features, the use cases, and just go to the payment flow, we can see XRP listed right there. So XRP is moved and converted to the destination currency for distribution by the payout partner. So whether it's XRP, whether it's the RLUS dollar stablecoin, whether it's another crypto asset, it still seems like it's actually using crypto. 
So basically to me, it looks like Ripple, the company has set themselves up as the payments provider so that the companies, the payments originator and the payment beneficiary don't need to actually touch crypto. So for me, not financial advice, this just seems like a more compliant version of what ODL was. So basically how I understand this today is we have the sending customer and we have the beneficiary and the users of the Ripple Payments Direct don't need to hold or manage the crypto because Ripple Payments Direct is handling this on their behalf. So I see a lot of speculation on this and concerns if XRP is even going to be used, but XRP is listed in step four, so I believe it is. So tons of conversations around if this is the possible workaround that David Schwartz has hinted where Ripple actually moves the XRP to the PAL partner. A um, lot of conversations on Ripple finding a US nexus or a connection point for ODL or what's today called Ripple payments. And to me, this seems like a similar thing that Casper Labs is doing with Prove AI charging a SaaS fee or software as a service fee in US dollars to the customer, because that's what enterprise customers are used to paying in, is just the US dollar. And then the vendor on the back end just settles this, purchasing Casper, because every transaction on Casper's mainnet requires Casper. So that's just an example of giving the enterprise customer the option to pay in US dollars or they actually pay in crypto directly, but it's still settled on the back end regardless in Casper. And that also reminds me of Quant or QNT a few years ago. I forget what it was, but I think it was like for the license fee or something. And basically people saw that they accepted US dollar and everybody was freaking out saying, oh no, you don't need QNT. I think it's the same thing. You still need QNT and same thing with XRP. So it seems like more of a compliant way where enterprise customers don't have to hold crypto or even touch it and have it on their balance sheet and still access the benefits. But please correct me if I'm wrong, it does say all of this verbatim right here, Ripple takes care of delivering payments to beneficiaries, managing payout partners, providing funds to payout partners, and paying charges in exchange for payment delivery to the beneficiaries. I can't find a recent clip, I know I played it on a YouTube video over the past few months and it was recent of Brad Garlinghouse saying something along the lines of XRP and caring about XRP and just saying if you don't think that XRP is a primary focus, you're missing the entire point. So if you guys have that actual link to that clip, please comment down below. That was terribly explained, but just an example of Ripple just saying that their focus is on XRP. All right, next up, shared by XRP scan. So we know that the RL US dollar right there, we can see the issuer is now available on the XRP mainnet for beta testing. So this is the stable coin. And it was also announced that the XRP ledger has crossed the milestone of over 90 million ledgers closed. So there's confusion because we know that there are over 2.5 billion transactions on the XRP ledger with 90 million ledgers closed. So think of each ledger as basically a record of the state of the network at a time, and this can include all the validated transactions since the ledger was last closed. So a single closed ledger can contain a bunch of transactions. We also had this news shared by the Digital Euro Association. So we have this group, DECTA in Ireland and Next Generation France launch an EUT, a Europeg stablecoin compliant with Mika. So this is the regulatory framework in the European Union, Markets and Crypto Assets Regulation, we can see this stablecoin will operate on Stellar and three other blockchains. Maybe I'm blind, but just highlighting the stablecoin they do say will initially be issued on the Stellar blockchain with plans to support three additional platforms. I don't think I see the mentions or the names of the three other platforms, so I'll have to look more into this. And on this page, for some reason, I just can't control Zoom, so I'll try to crop this. We can see Next Generation is closely affiliated with Tempo France, another European fintech which initially launched the Euro T with the Stellar Foundation is one of their first stablecoins back in 2017. However, the stablecoin project was eventually suspended due to a lack of regulatory framework. Implementing Mika today provides new opportunities and a green light for this project. So again, the Mika framework in the European Union is a really big deal for legal and compliant use of stablecoins with issuers, and this paves the way for the stablecoin market cap to increase. We know the projections or predictions for the stablecoin market cap alone to exceed $2.8 trillion by 2028, which is much bigger than the entire crypto asset class today. So that would be a lot of liquidity, interoperability with other fiat currencies, other companies and stablecoins like PayPal, other exchanges, etc. We also have shared right here by PureSyst. So we are a couple days slash weeks away to release a very exciting product that will help a lot facilitate the onboarding, usability, and access to both the XRP Ledger mainnet and the XRPL EVM sidechain. And speaking of stablecoins, this image is shared by Smoke Dog, so we can see stablecoin legislation map, so countries with established or proposed legislation. So the United States currently developing the Stablecoin Trust Act. We have the EU with the Markets and Crypto Assets Regulation. We have the United Kingdom right here to establish stablecoin laws by the end of 2024. 
We have Switzerland, currently has some of the most comprehensive stablecoin laws, including KYC and AML requirements. We have Hong Kong has announced intentions for a comprehensive licensing plan for all stablecoins and lay out clearly defined regulations. And we have Singapore, the MAS or the Monetary Authority of Singapore, basically like the central bank or regulatory authority, regulates stablecoins under the Payment Services Act. And whenever I see Singapore, I just think of this from this news last October, Ripple secures an MPI license or major payments institution license from the Monetary Authority of Singapore. So with the full license, Ripple the company can continue to provide regulated digital payment token services in Singapore. We also have this clip. This is shared by Mr. Man over at the AIBC World Summit. I'm not sure if this is a recent clip, if this was at the June Summit, or if this is a while ago, but we can see the AIBC Artificial Intelligence Blockchain and Cryptocurrency. Protecting yourself, but do I think there's going to be a bull run? I can't predict the market, but it's, uh, it feels like the time is right. You know, the likes of ETH and uh, uh, BTC have slightly come up good. And the problem is, this is the problem with, with, with trying to predict a bull run. Um, now I'm going to um, bars, clubs, restaurants, pubs, family events, and people are talking about crypto. So automatically, in my mind, I'm thinking it's perhaps a little bit too late because this is where the layman starts coming in and, and that last uh, push comes before the next pullback. So. I think, you know, I'd, I'd be cautious at this level, but I, I think over 24 and 25, there would be a bull run. So I thought that was interesting, whether you're bearish and you think there's going to be a huge economic collapse or we get another cycle. In the beginning of this year, I shared comparing all these cycle lengths, measuring from top to top, low to top, having to tops, election dates, and all of those considerations show 2024 or 2025. Does it happen soon? Does it take even longer? We have no idea, but those are the things that I'm hoping for to see confirmation from Bitcoin drawing its first major move or Bitcoin dominance crashing for alls to retrace again. Until we see actual positive price action again, the crypto asset class is a joke to the masses and that's understandable. But if history rhymes and we get another liquidity cycle like the three previous cycles over the past 10 plus years, we get another bull run. And also hoping that some of these predictions like these spot Bitcoin ETFs could see $220 billion of inflows over the next three years, according to JMP Securities. We also have right here, JP Morgan estimated $62 billion of Bitcoin ETF inflows in the next two to three years. So $62 billion and $220 billion of inflows. Going to the block and looking at Bitcoin spot ETFs, we can see the ETF AUM daily. Let me expand this really quick. We can see total AUM in the Bitcoin spot ETFs is around 54 billion today. So over the long term, definitely hoping to see AUM reach 100 billion or 200 billion plus, and also considering even Ethereum spot ETF AUM. So since launching, this was just shy of $10 billion. We can see today we are down around 7.3 billion. And last but not least, guys, we have iTrust Capital linked in the top of the YouTube video description for anybody interested in a crypto retirement account. I've had a Roth IRA here for over four years. There are no monthly fees whatsoever, and they do leverage a qualified custodian. So per the terms, if they went out of business and they were last valued around $1.3 billion, we still get our funds by law, unlike if an exchange went out of business. Feel free to check them out. They have 30 plus assets available, and I know they're going to be adding a bunch more assets in the future with some big news by the end of this year. So thanks so much for watching, guys. I'm keeping tabs on this storm that's going to be hitting shortly. So luckily it doesn't look like, you know, some big hurricane, but still strong winds. So hopefully I can upload this video before my power goes out because power is definitely going out. I was running the generator earlier this morning, so this should be nothing compared to that last hurricane. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Stay tuned. We're going to dive into a bunch of recent news for other assets in the next one. If you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting the like button and sharing your thoughts down below. As always, you can find all links, including resources for charting, trading bots, platforms, wallets, portfolio trackers, and exclusive discounts in my link tree at the top of the video description. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.